Hi everybody, my name is Andy Bentley. I'm the Fish Collection Manager here at the Biodiversity Institute, where I look after our extensive fish collection that has about 680,000 specimens from about three and a half thousand species from 85 different countries around the world. It's representative of both marine and freshwater species. Um, and what I'd like to do today is show you some of the specimens in our collection that show weird and wonderful adaptations to their environment. This specimen that I have in front of me here is called a deep sea anglerfish. Um, deep water specimens are obviously known to show all sorts of really strange and wonderful adaptations to the very, very um, strong influences of that deep sea environment. Um, high pressure, no light, um, those kinds of things can, can bring about some, some very, very strange adaptations in fishes. Most of the deep water species are very dark in color so that they can blend into their environment um, to protect themselves against predators. They're also usually very laterally flattened. They have a very flat body um, because they are exi um, uh, exerted by so many forces of the water pressure down at those kinds of depths. Um, they need to have a very, very slim body so that they're not affected as much by those, um, by those pressures. The really interesting thing about these guys, the, the reason that he's called an anglerfish is because he has a fishing rod on his head. I'm sure you can see that against my shirt. So what this guy does is he feeds on his prey by putting out this little lure in front of his face at the end of this little fishing pole and he dangles it around in front of his face so that he can try and attract prey um, to, to himself and be able to eat um, that prey when it gets close to his big mouth at the front there. I'm sure you've seen one of these, uh, one of these species in um, Finding Nemo. Um, they used the, the basis of that, of that species in Finding Nemo was um, using this particular species. And so it has this huge fishing pole um, on its face with a little lure at the end that it can then lure all of those um, fish into its mouth um, to be able to feed on them. The other interesting thing about this species is this is a female. So the females get really, really large. And what happens is that when they first mate with a male, the male becomes parasitic on the female. There isn't a male on this particular specimen. But what happens is that the male will bite into the flesh of the female and then will become parasitic on the male, on the female. So the male will lose all of his other internal organs except for his testes um, so that he can mate with the female. But he will rely on the female's blood supply to provide him with um, both oxygenation and with um, food. And so the male lives attached to the female for the rest of his life. Um, and so the female will be swimming around with this male attached to them all the time. And that male will then provide the sperm to be able to fertilize the eggs for the female. But that's basically all he does for the rest of his life. Um, he cannot live freely um, after that. Once he's lost all of those um, internal organs and becomes parasitic on the female, he stays on the female for the rest of his life. Um, so it's very much uh, a, a, a situation where the male becomes parasitic on the female um, and cannot survive um, thereafter. This is a species that was collected off of Greenland um, in some very, very deep water. So these guys live um, very, very deep down in the ocean. Um, it's not a very common species. It's not found very often in collections. So we're very lucky to have one of these in our collection. This specimen that I have in front of me here is called a spined gurnard or a flying gurnard. Um, it's very unique, lives fairly deep down in the ocean. Um, hence the big eyes so that it can draw in as much light as possible into its eyes and see what it's doing. It's a very heavily armored specimen. You can see all of these spines all over its body that it uses to protect itself against predators. But the unique thing about this specimen um, is that it lives on the sand at the bottom and feeds on little things that burrow down into the sand at the bottom. And so it has this little fork on the front of its face here that it uses to dig around in the sand at the bottom and bring all those little animals up to the surface so that it can feed on them. The reason that this is called a flying gurnard is because it has wings. So here you can see that this specimen has these wings on each side of its body. Um, it's obviously a deep water living species, so it's not using these to fly. It's using them for other reasons. One of the reasons is to make itself look bigger, to, to evade predators. So the bigger you can make yourself, the less predators are going to be able to eat you. And so they will fan these fins out to try and make themselves look bigger um, to try and evade predators. These, spi these um, spines usually have um, brilliant colors on them, which can sometimes um, fool predators into thinking that they're poisonous as well. And so they'll have these brilliant colors, colors on the margins of these fins that they will sometimes use to try and um, make predators think that they're, that they're poisonous as well. 
The other cool adaptation of these fins is that they can use these little adaptations here on these fins at the bottom to be able to walk around on the bottom. So these guys live in very sandy or muddy environments. Um, and so if they were to use their fins too much, all the mud and the sand would come up into the, into the water column and they wouldn't be able to see what they're doing. So they use these little um, adaptations of the spines of these fins to then walk around at the bottom. You can see that it almost has a little, a little um, elbow joint here and a little pad at the end. And so they can use these little three fingered projections to then slowly but surely walk around on the bottom um, to be able to, to um, scratch around in the bottom and try and find their prey, but also to be able to move around at the bottom so that they can catch the, the little animals that are burrowing down into the sand um, that they want to eat. The other thing that, that this specimen demonstrates is one of the problems that we have in natural history collections where all of the specimens that we collect lose all of their color. And so it's very important for us to take images of these specimens while they're still alive so that we can tell what they actually look like when they're alive. This specimen, when it was alive, is an iridescent red color all over its body. And so you can see how all of that color has been lost on the body. Um, and we can no longer tell what the specimen looked like when it was alive. So now routinely in the field, when we go out and collect these specimens, we're actually taking images of them while they're still alive or shortly after they've been killed um, in order to be able to get an idea of what that original coloration pattern of that specimen was. This specimen that I have in front of me here is a halibut or a flatfish. There are a number of different groups of flatfish, the sole, the halibut, the flounder, um, and all of them exhibit this really strange behavior of um, moving down onto the bottom and living flat on the bottom. So when these guys are really, really small, so this kind of size here, um, they look like a regular fish. So I don't know if you can see this little guy here has an eye on each side of his body and he looks like a regular fish. But during this early stage of their development, when they're really, really tiny, they go through this metamorphosis process where they move down, they migrate down onto the bottom to, to live on the sand flat on their, on their bodies um, and then go through this metamorphosis process where the eye from the one side of the head moves onto the other side of the head and the other side of the body has nothing on it. So that's more visible in this large specimen here. So you can see here that on this side of the head, both of the eyes are on this side of the head and on this side of the body, there is nothing. And so what this guy does is he lives on the sand at the bottom and swims through the ocean like this instead of like a regular fish swimming through the ocean like this. And so they will, they will spend most of their lives lying on the sand at the bottom. Um, they feed on little animals that, that, that swim around at the bottom. Um, and so they can also bury themselves in the sand with just their little eyes sticking out of the top so that they can ambush stuff um, at the bottom and also um, evade predators by disguising themselves into the sand at the bottom. But you can see that on this side of his body, he has these two, these two eyes on one side and the mouth now opens this way. So what essentially happens with these specimens is they start out life like a regular fish with their head like this, with an eye on each side of the, of the head. And then what happens during that metamorphosis process when they're really young and the bones are still very supple is that the bones of the head will essentially do this so that you'll end up with two eyes on the same side of the head. It's not that the eye migrates over onto the other side of the head, it's that the whole body structure and, and bony structure of the head actually changes design while they're um, really, really tiny in this kind of, in this kind of stage. Um, and then they will spend the rest of their lives lying on the bottom and feeding on little animals that, that feed on the bottom. So they've adapted themselves to a new environment of not swimming through the water column and catching things in the water column, but actually living on the sand at the bottom and feeding on little animals that that have, that have um, that live in that kind of environment down on the bottom um, in the sand. This specimen here is an electric ray um, found in most of the tropical areas around the world, um, mainly estuarine environments, where it lives in sandy environments um, on the bottom. And the unique thing about this guy is that it can generate an electric current, much like sticking your finger in a plug. Um, you know, when you take a balloon and you rub it up against your hair, um, you'll generate static electricity. And that's what this guy can do. He can generate static electricity by rubbing his muscles together and then storing that, um, that electricity in this gelatinous substance in his body. He then uses that to both catch his prey and also to evade predators. So these guys will bury themselves in the sand at the bottom with just their two little eyes sticking out the top. You can see his two little eyes just at the front here. Um, and they will wait for something to swim up very close. 
once that specimen swims up really close, they will then send out this jolt of electricity through the seawater in order to try and um, catch that, that prey. It'll stun the specimen um, and then they'll come out from the sand and they'll eat it with this tiny little mouth that you can see on the other side of his body here. You can see this tiny little mouth here. Obviously, because he's living on the sand at the bottom, he doesn't need to have anything on this side of his body um, because it's in contact with the sand all the time. Um, and so he lives on the sand at, in the sand at the bottom um, and both catches his prey and also uses it to evade predators. If something large is coming to try and eat this guy, um, he will send, a jolt, send that same jolt of electricity through the water in the hopes that it'll stun the, 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 the predator that's coming to try and eat him. These guys can get relatively big. This is a small specimen. They get about three times the size. Um, and the bigger they get, the more electric current they can generate. Um, I've actually stood on one of these things in an estuary once, and it is literally like sticking your finger in a plug. It sends a jolt of electricity through your body that stuns you for a couple of seconds. Um, so I know exactly how effective this electric, electric current is um, that these guys can generate.